For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we see seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Can we just pray? Our Heavenly Father and God, we thank you for this wonderful morning that you had blessed us with, Father. We thank you for opportunities like this, Father, where we can come together in your presence. Even though many of us are separated by distance, we are brought together by the love and bond that we have through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for loving us in spite of our sins. We were so far away from you, but you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for helping us to remember that today morning. We thank you for helping us to take part from the sacraments, Father. And uh, Father, as now we sit before your word, we pray for Raven as he speaks to us, Father. We pray that you would give him the, your grace and strength. And as he speaks from your word, Father, pray that you would speak through him, Father. And Father, we pray that you would open our hearts, keep our minds focused, and we would listen to your words. And we pray that your words would latch on to our hearts and that we would be able to apply it in our lives. We thank you for this morning. We ask all these things, knowing that you will answer them in and through the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Just one good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's, uh, although it may sound hackneyed and cliched, I do want to say with all my heart that uh, it's a joy to be standing here. It's a joy to be seeing all of you in person. And uh, I think just before the lockdown, the last Sunday before the lockdown, I stood here and I spoke from First Thessalonians. Little did I know that right from the next Sunday, we wouldn't be meeting. And uh, it's been nine months since I came here. And so it's such a joy to be standing here. It's such a joy to be seeing all of you from here. Uh, although, uh, by God's grace, we did minister online, but to stand here in person and to be affirmed of our calling once again is, is such a wonderful thing. But I stand here this morning in the words of Paul in fear and trembling. Uh, I need your prayers this morning to be able to speak, <clears throat> so, uh, so please keep me in prayers. Also, one more clarificatory remark. Several of you asked me this question, and uh, I would have expected this from CBF. I'm not going for a party after this. <laughs> there is no wedding to go to, all right? Uh, I'm just feeling cold, and that's why this. All right, okay. So uh, we will get to God's word for this morning. The Great Wall of China, it took a lot of manpower, a lot of labor, and a lot of money to build it. And when it was finished, it seemed indestructible. But the enemy breached it not by tearing it down, not by going around it, but by being able to bribe the gatekeepers. Did you hear that? By being able to bribe the gatekeepers. The desperate need for today in church, my dear brothers and sisters, and the desperate need for today in ministry in general is not for intelligent people. It's not even for gifted people but for people who are faithful, but for people who have integrity. You know, when we look at the church around the world today, the Lord is doing wonderful things. But when we look at the Christian world, there are also things that are disappointing. You and I may have heard about several ministries and ministers who have tumbled down. And it saddens us to hear about that. So when we hear about perhaps somebody that we know or somebody whose ministry that we've been connected to, who's had a fall from grace, somebody who's coming to the great sexual sin or somebody who has dishonored the church 
and dishonored the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by acting in ways that he or she ought not to have acted. It really saddens us. Now, personally, you and I may not have encountered such people in our lives. But the fact of the matter is we've certainly heard of such people. And once again, when you hear of such things in ministry, it does make us sad. Perhaps it could be in your extended family that you've heard about such a person, or in your neighborhood, or somebody you've seen speaking on television. Or when we look at our own lives, some of us may be dealing with some personal sins for a long time, and something in our hearts cries out, this is not the way it ought to be in ministry. This is not the way a Christian ought to live. So the questions come up in our minds. How should I serve in view of the Lord's imminent return? How should I serve in view of the Lord's imminent return? Or what are some of the things I need to do to leave a lasting impact in this world as a believer in Christ? What are some of the things that I need to do and you need to do as believers in Christ to leave a lasting impact in this world? Perhaps after we are gone or perhaps even when we are here or better, how do I need to serve and live so that people looking at my life and my service would understand I'm really looking forward to the Lord's return? How do I live in such a way and how do I serve in such a way so that people looking at my life and your life would say he is really looking forward to the Lord's return? You know, these questions have been answered right in the first century AD. And Paul ministered in a place called Thessalonica. He had a brief ministry there. And as he ministered there, there was a miracle that, was, that happened in that city. And that was the establishment of the church at Thessalonica. But like I said, he was there for a very brief period. And in that brief period, a, very, a lot of prominent men and women from the city came into the church. Several Greeks, the Gentiles, were converted to Christ, and a few Jews were converted. But largely, the, the church at Thessalonica were consisted of Gentile people. Now, in order to understand this letter, we need to understand one important point from this uh, First Thessalonians. And hear me, please. Paul left the church at Thessalonica. Paul left the town of Thessalonica before he actually wanted to. Paul left the church at Thessalonica before he actually wanted to. So his premature leaving caused many of the younger believers who were in church to doubt the very integrity of Paul, to doubt his ministry, to doubt the intentions of his coming there to the town and establishing that church. And after leaving Thessalonica, Paul went to Athens. He was sitting in Athens and he sent Timothy to check about the health of the church while Paul alone from Athens went to Corinth. And so Timothy goes there to the church and he comes back with a very good report about the church at Thessalonica, that the church at Thessalonica has a great testimony. In fact, they're being talked about all over Achaia and Macedonia. These are huge areas, by the way. Such a great testimony about the church at Thessalonica, but there was a problem. The Timothy comes and tells Paul that people are talking bad about your character. They were looking down upon your integrity. They were saying that you are not a man of integrity and they attacked your sincerity as well. So they were doing everything they could to be hostile towards the church. And these may have been some hostile Jews in the church there at Thessalonica or perhaps outside the church there in Thessalonica. And I wanna say this to you, one way to tear up the church is to destroy the confidence in the men and the women that God used to found the church. And that's exactly what these people were doing here. Now the ancient, people, the ancient world was full of phony spiritual leaders. The Greek culture had a lot of phony spiritual leaders. So it was easy to cast Paul into that same category. And that's exactly what these people were doing. They said Paul was in ministry for his own personal gain. They said Paul was in ministry for power, possessions and prestige. So the attack was against his integrity. The attack was against his sincerity. It was an effort to make the Thessalonian church believe that Paul was a man of wicked intentions. And it is, it's only with wicked intentions that he came to the church at Thessalonica 
or to the town, uh, town of Thessalonica and establish the church there. He was a self-seeking, deceptive leader like so many others. That is what is the report that Timothy brought about Paul to Paul while he was in Corinth. But he also said this, that there were some doctrinal problems in the church. There were some moral problems as well. And Paul, listening to all of this, wanted to immediately return to Thessalonica, but circumstances prevented him from doing so. And therefore, he writes this encouraging letter to the church at Thessalonica, and we call that First Thessalonians in our Bible. It is an encouraging letter. And one important prominent feature about both the Thessalonian epistles is that Paul, in these two epistles, more than the other 11 epistles that he wrote, talks more about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In these two epistles, the emphasis is on the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point of the epistles is, how do we live and how do we serve in light of the imminent return of the Lord? Because the Lord's return is near, because Jesus Christ could crack the skies open at any moment and come to take us. In light of that fact, how do I live and how do I serve? Now, you may be asking the question, Raven, but I'm not a Christian leader. I'm not directly in any ministry or heading any ministry. How does this apply to me? And I want to remind you that every believer is in the ministry. Every believer is in some form of the ministry or another. We all have ministry responsibilities. If, you if you're a parent, you have a little flock at home whom you're ministering to. If you're a working professional, you are a minister for the Lord at your workplace. If you are the head of the family, a husband, you have a flock, a small family that you need to take care of. If you're somebody who meets with other families, unbelieving families to reach out to them, you're ministering to them. And so I want to remind each one of us this morning that this applies directly to each one of us, whether we are directly involved in any kind of a ministry or not, whether we are a spiritual leader in a church or in a ministry or not. So today's passage will reveal to us three characteristics that a genuine servant of God needs to have. Three characteristics that a genuine servant of God needs to have. Now, looking at which, the people around us and the world around us will say, this guy or this sister or this woman of God is really looking forward to the Lord's return. So Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, answers his critiques by elaborating these three characteristics in the portion that was read out for us, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And as always, we have, we have the outline here, and uh, my brother Ajit will help me in going step by step. I will request him not to go ahead of me, but as I, as I give the points, please, uh, please click on to the next one. So in verses 1 and 2, you will see that an authentic servant has an immense confidence in God's power. Now, these are three very simple points, straightforward and very practical. And listen to me very carefully, please. Number one, in verses 1 and 2, like I said, you will see that an authentic servant has immense confidence in God's power. An authentic servant has immense confidence in God's power. A true servant of God draws his strength from the power of God, draws his strength from the fact that God is a powerful God and we serve a powerful God. That's exactly what Paul did. Paul ministered in a tough setting with immense confidence in God's power. And he narrates two small vignettes for us from his ministry. And I want to go step by step as we go through this. First thing that Paul says is Paul suffered much before he came to Thessalonica. Paul suffered much before he came to Thessalonica. Chapter, uh, chapter 2 verses 1 and the first part of verse 2 or 2a as we call it. Let me read that for you from the ESV here. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know. Now, you remember, Paul was in Philippi before he came to Thessalonica. And you also remember what happened in Philippi, how Paul and Silas ended up in the prison. Now, they had to confront the kingdom of darkness with the power of the kingdom of God. They went around preaching the word of God and the word of the kingdom of God. And as they did that, they encountered this demon-possessed girl. 
and their owners were making a lot of money from her. And so Paul and Silas, they go and with the power of God, they dispossess this girl of the demon. And there was a lot of rage there from her owners and they were put in prison unjustly. And Paul here is using two ways in which Paul and Silas were mistreated. Now look at the words. He says, we have suffered. We have suffered. Now, in the Greek, that has to basically do with the physical suffering that they went through. They were beaten. They were unjustly put in prison. And he's also using the word shamefully treated. Again, in the original language, it has to do with legal abuse that they went through. So they went through a physical abuse. They went through a legal abuse. They were unjustly judged and they were made prisoners when they had committed no crime. You can read the story in Acts 16 that they were publicly humiliated and they were also physically abused. Why were they physically abused? Why were they legally abused? Because they preached the word of God, because they preached the gospel. So remember this as we move step by step here. Paul suffered much at Philippi before he came to Thessalonica. The second point here. The next point, please. So Paul wasn't deterred by persecution. The second part of verse two. Look at that, please. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. once said this. Now hear me, please. The door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. Did you hear that? The door of opportunity swings on the hinges of opposition. Paul certainly found that to be true in Thessalonica. Now, when Paul came to Thessalonica, you remember he, would, he was already persecuted badly in the church at, or sorry, in the town of Philippi. Now, he didn't come to Thessalonica and say, now I need to change my strategy because I faced persecution in Philippi. No, he doesn't say that, but notice what he says. We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Gospel ministry or any Christian ministry is rarely popular. Any Christian ministry is rarely popular. For every person who receives us gladly, many more will have nothing to do with us. And if you're waiting to win the world by acclamation, it isn't going to happen. And that's why Jesus said this, if the world hates you, remember that it first hated me. That's what Jesus said in John 15, 18. So sooner or later, those words will come true for all servants of God and even for all Christians in general. But the terrible reaction in Thessalonica indicated that they were actually preaching the truth. When you confront an ungodly culture with the godly gospel of Jesus Christ, you're bound to get such a reaction. And that's exactly what Paul was facing here. And yet, Paul had immense confidence in God's power, and that gave him persistence in ministry. To put it simply, that this man, Paul, had such tremendous confidence in the power of God to energize his ministry and to protect him from anything that might come against him to harm him. And he always thought and believed that God was bigger than the opposition. He is able to protect us in his sovereignty. So that immediately translated into boldness and courage in the ministry of Paul. Now, he is saying here that our ministry was not in vain. But on the other hand, our ministry came to you with great boldness and was full and rich and effective. Why is he able to say that? Because he knew the power of God and he was confident that God was more powerful than the opposition. That's what gives strength to ministry. And that's what gave strength to Paul's ministry. Now, in application, we should always serve with confidence in God's power. We should always live our Christian lives with confidence in God's power. We need to have the courage to do ministry no matter what the response might be. And I think sometimes the best thing to do is to keep, the, keep doing the right thing that you're doing. Even when there's no reaction from people often. And even when you don't get, get attention from people often, if you keep doing the right thing long enough, sooner or later, you will see positive results. Now, someone has said that, that the real measure of a person is what it takes to stop him. The real measure of a person is what it takes to stop him. We all want to be witnesses for Christ. We all want to truly make an impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the people who make a real difference depend so much on God that they aren't intimidated by opposition. 
and in ministry, and I want to say this as honestly as I can, there's always pressure to compromise. There's always pressure to sugarcoat your message. There's always pressure not to offend somebody. But we must minister with immense confidence in God's power and discharge our duties right. That should be the source of our confidence. So in verses 1 and 2 is our first point. An authentic servant has immense confidence in God's power. Now there's a second thing that we need to look at from this passage. And they are, that is in verses 3 and 4. They give us a second mark of an authentic servant. They say, they say that an authentic servant has the right message and pure motives. An authentic servant has the right message and pure motives. A true servant of God is committed to God's truth and he has the right intentions. A true servant of God is committed to God's truth and he has the right intentions. Now, Paul preached with the right motives and a straightforward approach, and he says three things about it. Let's look at them one by one. First thing, Paul's content was true. Look at the first part of verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error. Our appeal does not spring from error. Now look at the heart of Paul here. The word appeal here means an urgent cry in view of the judgment that is coming. It is an exhortation that is given to people in view of the judgment that is coming. It is a calling that is given to people. And it speaks of the urgency, the directness of the message. Paul is calling out to people to repent, to turn to God with the truth of God's message in view of the coming day of the Lord, in view of the coming judgment. And he also uses the word error here. It's a very interesting one in the original language. It means to wander. It means to roam. Error is a roaming from the truth of God's word. Error is a roaming from the truth of God's word. Wandering as it were without any standard. Paul is saying, no, our exhortation does not come from error. He was committed to God's truth. It was accurate what he preached. He was not deceived. Neither was he a deceiver. He is not spreading falsehoods or aimless speculations. There was only one thing that he preached, which is the word of God. Now, some people, especially the Jewish unbelievers, may have accused Paul of being ignorant of the Old Testament revelation. But Paul was saying that what he's preaching is accurate. He was a guardian of the truth. My dear brothers and sisters, we all ought to be guardians of the truth. We need to keep it pure and hand it over to the next generation. And that's our responsibility as well. Second thing. Paul says his motives were pure too. Look at the second part of verse 3. Or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Now Paul's motives were not deceitful. Now hear me please. This is a very interesting word that is used for the word deceit. The word deceit here means a fish hook. It's a trap. It's a trick. And the Greek false teachers there in that culture would go to any length with their magic and sorcery and such things to gain a single convert. And Paul was saying, I didn't do that. I didn't use a fish hook to trap you. I didn't use a trick or a trap to trap you. I'm not a deceiver. Thirdly, Paul's goal was to please God. Look at verse 4, please. But just as we have been approved by God. Now, if you have the habit of underlining in your Bibles, please do. We have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that he was commissioned by God's will. And once he was commissioned by God's will, that gave him authority. He was commissioned by God and that gave him authority. Why are you speaking, Paul? Paul, why are you preaching the word of God? Because he's under divine authority and he's been entrusted with the word of God. He's been entrusted with the truth of God. Now look at the phrase that Paul is using here. Just as we have been approved by God. And by the way, I asked you all to underline that, that, that phrase there. Uh, just as we have been approved by God. It's the Greek verb dokimazo, which means to look at something in a test. And it comes out on the other side successful. It has passed the test. And Paul is saying, God has tested us. 
God has tested us and he approved us because we came out on the other side successful. God himself has tested us and God has approved us. Now, it's in a perfect tense, which means it's a lasting approval. It's not a one-off approval or a one-time approval. It's a lasting approval that God has on Paul. And Paul is saying this, we have been approved by God. God has tested us. We pass the test and we are the authorized ministers of the gospel. We are the authorized ministers of the word of God. So here you have a man who is under authority. And yet he understands it is not an absolute authority. It is a delegated authority. It has been given to him by God himself. Now move on, please, and look at the phrase that Paul is using here. Not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. He was compelled by God's knowledge. He was compelled by God's omniscience. And that gave him accountability. Now hear me please, on the one hand he has authority and the right tipping point to balance it on the other side is accountability. Authority must be balanced by accountability and what gave him accountability? God's omniscience gave him accountability. He is saying that it is not to please man but to please God who tests our hearts. God knows the intentions of my heart is what Paul is saying. God knows the intentions with which I come and minister here. God knows the intentions which, with which I came to Thessalonica to preach the gospel. I didn't use a fish hook to trap you guys. I used the truth. I used the truth of God's word and I spoke the truth of God's word. I have been approved by God. I have, I have the authority to preach the God's word, preach the word of God. But on the other hand, it's a delegated authority and it must be balanced by accountability because I know that God knows the very intentions of my heart. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. That's a great measure of accountability. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to remind us this morning as I remind myself that God examines our hearts. And here by the word heart, he is referring to the inner self, the real you, where thought and feeling and will and motive, all of them come together. He says God is scrutinizing the deepest self. He scrutinizes our motives. He scrutinizes our intentions. And God knows the deep things. And he is compelled by that knowledge. And Paul wants to please God alone. Paul wants to please God alone. We need to have the highest standards of truth and integrity, even as we live as Christians, and especially when we minister. The compulsion of our lives should be to hold fast to the truth of God's word and work with the right motives. Now, we are living in a time when it's not just enough to speak the truth in a nation like ours. It's also important to live out the truth that we are speaking. We must always back it up with a godly life. Now, unbelievers understand this very well. And that's why the cause of Christ is often heard so badly. When leaders fall into sin or Christians turn out to be hypocrites. People expect more from those who claim to represent God. They hold us to a higher standard, whether we like it or not. And Paul says that God has approved us to preach the gospel. I wanna ask this question this morning as sincerely as I can. And I ask this question of myself as well. Paul says, God has appro approved us to minister. Could God say the same thing of you? Could God say the same thing of me as I stand here and speak? And Paul's answer is an unequivocal yes. God can say that about him. What about you? And what about me? Two things that we saw so far about the marks of an authentic servant. The first thing is an authentic servant has immense confidence in God's power. The second thing is an authentic servant has the right message and pure motives. Then there's a third thing and final one, I'll be quick in this. It is mentioned in verses five through eight. And they say that an authentic servant has sincere methods. An authentic servant has sincere methods. We must ensure that the approach that we take in our lives as Christians and in our ministries is truthful. Now, Paul did exactly the same thing. Paul dealt with the Thessalonians with honesty and with utmost care. And he lists five things about it. Let's look at them one by one very quickly. Firstly, 
Paul never used flattery in his ministry. Look at the first part of verse 5. Paul never used flattery in his ministry. The first part of verse 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know. Now, hear me, please. Flattery is actually telling people exactly what they want to hear about themselves. Flattery is telling people exactly what they want to hear about themselves. But it's a form of exploitation. You know why? Because our human ego always wants to hear good things about ourselves. Now, don't get me wrong here, please. Marmon sang well this morning. And if I go to him at the end of the meeting and say, Marmon, you sang well with no other intention but just to appreciate him, that's not flattery. That's not flattery. But if I go and say to Marmon, you sang very well when he didn't sing well, you did, by the way, and I know that saying that would be of my benefit later on in life, that is flattery. And Paul is saying here, when we came to you to minister in Thessalonica, we didn't use flattery. We didn't use such things. In ministry, many leaders want to tell people what they want to hear. And that is flattery. It's not the word of God. But Paul says he never used flattery. Second thing. Paul didn't desire to get rich from his ministry. Look at the second part of verse 5. Nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Now, look at this again. He is pulling God into the equation. God is my witness. I never came with a pretext for greed. The word pretext here means to cover up the real intent of our heart. We didn't come putting a coat, of, coat over our greed is what Paul is saying here. And Paul is saying, I have not put a spiritual robe over my greed. I am not in the ministry for money. I'm not in the ministry for money is what Paul is saying. Now, I like to look at certain surveys about the Christian faith, and not all of them are right. I understand that. But at least it gives us an indication of what is the general consensus around the world. Surveys tell us that the number one complaint that unbelievers have about ministry is that the ministers are just after money. That's nothing new. Because 2,000 years ago, they said the exact same thing about Paul here. And that's the, that's the passage we are studying. But our answer should always be the same, which is the answer that Paul gave. And the answer is this. Look at the way we live. Watch our lifestyle. Check out our missionaries. They could have made more money through their degrees if they weren't in ministry, yet they go to the ends of the earth, learn a new language, go to a completely new culture, and live among people who are not always to look to happy to see their faces every morning. They do it gladly and without complaint. And Paul is saying, I'm not in ministry for riches. I didn't get, I didn't get into ministry to get rich from ministry. Third thing. Paul didn't misuse his authority. Look at verse 6. Nor did we seek to gl uh, seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul didn't even look for esteem there. He didn't look for honor. He didn't want praise. Paul was never habitually seeking honor. He was never habitually seeking awards and laurels or even appreciation dinners that many ministers get. He had, sure, some delegated authority, but he never asserted himself or sought honor because he knew his authority had to stop somewhere and it had to be balanced by humility and accountability. Fourthly, Paul was gentle and unselfish. Paul was gentle and unselfish. Look at verse 7, please. But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother. It's a beautiful picture in the New Testament, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Now, one of the distinguishing characteristics of mothers is that they are gentle. Uh, there are several mothers seated here. There are several mothers listening on Zoom. And we know that one of the distinguishing characteristics of mothers is that they are very gentle, especially towards their children. Now, this is a very lovely image, and I like it, uh, that is given about the Apostle Paul. And in fact, it goes against the grain of our mental picture about Paul. 
When you think of Paul, often the words that come into our minds to describe him are strong, determined, assertive, zealous, but gentleness is not one of them. But nonetheless, there it is here in this passage. But you know what? Gentleness is not a quality that is often respected today, especially in ministry. People like assertive leaders, people like strong leaders, people like tough leaders. But Paul is saying, I was gentle when I dealt with you, just like a nursing mother, just like a feeding mother. I was gentle with you. Now, that is the imagery that he uses to describe the bond that he has with the church at Thessalonica, a mother and a nursing, a nursing mother and a child. So just as a mother nourishes her own child with her own body, so Paul, as a spiritual parent, is nourishing in the faith these Thessalonians with the word of God. And by the way, every mother knows there are no appreciations for being a mother. All you get at the end of the day is dirty diapers, sleepless nights. And last night at 11.30, Ange called me up and she said, please pray, Zach is not sleeping. That's all you get for being a mother, you know it. And what you basically get is that it takes up all the time. But the feeling is so compelling in a mother. The affection is so profound, and that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. He had the same feelings for the Thessalonians. He had the same emotions for the Thessalonians. Fifthly and lastly, Paul was transparent with the Thessalonians. Verse eight, Paul was transparent with the Thessalonians. Look at verse eight, please, last verse. So being affectionate, affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Paul is saying, I didn't just keep preaching to you, but I gave myself to you. I gave of myself to you out of love for the Thessalonians. It's not for personal gain. And the secret of Paul's success is the continual selfless giving of his all to the church at Thessalonica. F.B. F.F. F. Bruce uh, once said this, and hear me please. He said, a gospel messenger who stands detached from his audience has not yet been touched by the very gospel he proclaims. Very powerful, isn't it? A gospel minister who stands here detached from the audience has not yet been touched by the very gospel he so boldly proclaims. Paul says he gave not just the gospel, but he gave of himself to the Thessalonians. My dear brothers and sisters, I want to say this as sincerely as I can. And I emphasize this point in my own study when I was looking at this. We need to have the heart of a mother in doing ministry. Ajit, we need to have the heart of a mother in doing ministry. No, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> we need to be gentle. We need to be unselfish like a nursing mother in dealing with people. God calls us to be sacrificial, to share not only the gospel of God, but also of our own selves with one another. He calls us to be mothers to those around us. He tells us lovingly to give our lives, to do it even when it hurts, and God will use that, is what Paul is saying. There's an important principle that I wrote down in my notes as I looked at this. Instruction must always spring from affection. Instruction must always spring from affection. And when instruction springs from such profound affection for people, it'll make a world of a difference in the lives of people. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Regardless of what the haters were saying around him, he was there giving not just the gospel, preaching not just the word, but he was giving of himself. There is power in that kind of a love. There is power in that kind of a ministry. So we need to have the heart of a mother in doing ministry. So what is the point of this morning's passage? The whole passage basically says, an authentic servant needs to have the right message, pure motives, and sincere methods with an immense confidence in God's power. An authentic servant needs to have the right message, pure motives, and sincere methods with an immense confidence in God's power. A true servant of God should learn the word, live the life, love the body of Christ, and go out into the world to proclaim the message. So three things, let me just refresh them for us, at least for my memory. Number one, 
An authentic servant has immense confidence in God's power. Number two, an authentic servant has a right message and pure motives. Number three, an authentic servant has sincere methods. You know, as the leaders go, so go the people. And the New Testament tells us to follow those who are over us and pattern our lives after them. And I want to say this very humbly, not just trusting in men merely, but trusting in the power of the indwelling spirit who works in the hearts of men, that there are several in this church that you and I can emulate. Let's follow their steps because there's not much time. Jesus Christ, our Lord, could come any moment and his return is imminent. And that's exactly why Paul is writing all these things. Thank you for your patience. May the Lord bless you all. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we want to thank you for these precious, powerful reminders from your word. None of us is worthy to stand here. None of us is worthy to take your word on our lips. And yet, in your grace, O Lord, you affirm us. We pray, O Lord, that this model would always challenge us. And in the New Testament, several times Paul has said, follow me just as I follow Christ. Help each one of us to be able to say that to others, O Lord, because we follow Jesus Christ and we want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in his footsteps. Father, we pray that this morning, each one of us from the passage that we heard will be able to make the necessary changes that are required in our lives, O Lord, in light of what we heard. And we pray, O Lord, that we would live and minister with an immense confidence in God's power, with the right message, pure motives, and all of this because the day is fast approaching. The end of all things is at hand and your return is imminent. We want to thank you for everything. We also want to pray for the second session that's going to happen. We pray for your hand of blessing upon it. And we want to thank you for being with us and counting us in the land of the living. In Jesus' name.